Hey everyone, it is Friday. It's time for our weekly compilation video. As you can see, my office is getting cleaned out up here in Bartlesville as I get ready to transition over to the Haven Center for Sexual Medicine and Vulvovaginal Disorders. That clinic opens on the 4th of October. So if you have questions about that, make sure you send them to me. Um, other housekeeping things, uh, next Monday night, uh, Jacqueline from the Lost Labia Chronicles and I are doing a Instagram live um, discussing lichen sclerosis and autoimmune disease. Um, and so if you um, are watching this today and you have questions about that, shoot either her or myself a message and we'll answer those questions. So in this week, we've been talking about Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and kind of how it relates to women's health. Now, if you are unfamiliar with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome or EDS, that's totally fine. Um, it's basically a collection of syndromes or conditions that affect the way connective tissue forms. Now, most people, when they think about connective tissue and collagen and specific, or specifically, think about the skin. Um, you know, you can see commercials for collagen plumping things or, you know, beauty supplies or whatever it may be that help with collagen. And obviously, there's lots of collagen in your skin. <laughs> But there is also collagen in your joints, in your muscles, in your blood vessels. Pretty much throughout your entire body, there's collagen. And so if you have a condition that affects the way the collagen works, it can cause lots and lots of uh, issues. Um, and this is why, honestly, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome should really be more like the Ehlers-Danlos Syndromes. There's currently 13 described EDS kind of subtypes. There's probably many, many, many more out there. Um, and we don't at this moment have one exact thing that we can say that ties them all together, like one abnormal gene or whatever it may be. So some of them share things in common, but basically um, there's, like I said, all those different subtypes. So if you think you have EDS, you really want to try and seek out a healthcare provider that is knowledgeable in that condition so that you can get the best treatment that um, you need. So um, with that, obviously in the realm of gynecology, the things that we focus with EDS typically are issues related to pregnancy, um, pelvic health, sexual health, and um, you know menstruation, and kind of some menopausal changes. So it's kind of tie into pelvic health too, I guess I should say. But, you know, we focused on those kind of individually this week. So I think what we'll do today is kind of start off from the beginning and kind of work our way through kind of a normal um, age-related thing. So from a pre-pubertal standpoint, many patients with EDS are, um, you know, very hypermobile, especially if they have the hypermobility types. Um, so as children, they may be able to, you know, dislocate their joints or be double-jointed or, you know, bend their finger down to touch their, you know, arm down here or have really stretchy skin depending on the type of EDS that they have. And usually uh, as kids, this is not so much of an issue unless you have some of the vascular subtypes, which do carry with them much more, you know, likely or higher risks of, um, you know, injury, um, uh, bleeding internally, things like that. But in very active children, what you may find if they have EDS would be increasing frequency of things like dislocations or, you know, um, sprains or, or uh, strains, tears to the ligaments or to the tendons, respectively. Um, and so, you know, with that, like if that kind of, if you have a child that has a lot of these injuries, that may make you want to kind of clue in that there could be something going on. Now, when um, menstruation starts, what we typically see in EDS patients is that they have heavier periods. Part of this is due to um, oh, the way that kind of the, the uterus works, you know, with menstrual bleeding, the uterus will cramp down to help stop bleeding. That's why most patients have a cramping sensation. Um, but with EDS, it may not cramp as effectively. The other thing that we see is increased vascular fragility. And by that, what I mean, the blood vessels themselves may tear or may be injured more easily, so they may have heavier bleeding. Now, especially some of the vascular subtypes, they may have more nosebleeds and other types of, you know, bleeding issues. But um, almost universally, pa you know, patients um, with EDS with menstruation will have heavier periods. Now, as time kind of goes on and patients may become sexually active, what they may notice is pain with penetration, um, pain with deep penetration. Um, and these can be due to issues with not only the very kind of, you know, fragile skin at the entrance to the vagina, um, you know, tears on the vulva within the vestibule itself. Um, a lot of times, though, patients with EDS may also have problems with lubrication. 
um, you know, if it's affecting the way that the collagen has made up those glandular structures and those glandular ducts, um, then they may have a lot more, you know, vaginal dryness or decreased, you know, lubrication with sexual activity. So they may complain of, of those type of symptoms. From a um, deep pelvic pain standpoint, um, what you can see is that if the pelvic floor muscles are, you know, or if the pelvic um, support structures, like some of the ligaments and things like that are weakened, the muscles will kind of be spasmed in an effort to try and hold things up, if you will. And just like if you have a spasmed muscle someplace, you know, let's say in your trapezius, and someone comes along and pokes it, and you're like, ow, please stop. That's actually kind of sore on me today. Um, you know, then that can be painful. Same thing with penetrative sexual activity. If something is hitting that spasmed muscle, it's not going to be comfortable. And so these patients may complain of pain with deep penetration. Certain sexual positions may be more uncomfortable. The other thing that we often see is post-orgasmic pelvic pain. So with orgasm, the whole pelvic floor will contract down um, or kind of does like this. And especially if those muscles are spasmed, they may actually spasm very tightly and have some issues with that. So these patients may say, uh, it hurts some when I have sex, but man, it hurts after I have sex a lot more. Um, as kind of time goes on, if these patients do become pregnant, then what we typically see is an increase in kind of that pregnancy waddle. Um, this is due to loosening of the support structures in the pelvis, especially in the pelvic bones. Um, there's a hormone called relaxin that's released in pregnancy. It's more of a vascular thing, but it does relax the ligaments in between the pelvic bones. And with patients with EDS, this is even more pronounced. So they may have a lot more pain and joint and issues in their pelvis and other parts of their body with pregnancy. Um, they also may have a higher likelihood of having preterm labor, um, you know, as obviously that collagen is in the uterus, it's in the cervix, and if that stretches, if it's not as tight, then you can have babies that are born earlier than they should be. Um, likewise, patients may have more of a rapid labor, um, or they may actually have a prolonged labor too. I've seen it kind of both ways, but I remember one EDS patient I have that went from a three centimeters dilated to complete in about five minutes, um, and it's just goes like that sometimes, so you kind of have to be ready for them. Um, you know, postpartum, in terms of um, kind of pelvic floor healing, you know, we see a higher rate of um, pelvic organ prolapse in these patients. Once again, if those support muscles or, excuse me, support structures are not working well, you're going to see a deficit or a, a defect in the um, actual support inside the vagina. So you may have the uterus kind of prolapse more forward. I guess that'd be more forward to you all. You may see the bladder kind of prolapse down. That's called a cystocele. You may also see the bottom part of the vagina kind of bulge up. That's called a rectocele. Um, and what's going on there is that the, the collagen kind of fascial layer that's in between, in the case, you know, the vagina and either the bladder or the rectum has separated. And so it allows that underlying organ to bulge one way or the other. Like I said, this may be pronounced more in patients with EDS. Um, the other thing from a pregnancy standpoint too, if these patients have C-sections, they may also have decreased wound healing, obviously, and this goes actually for any type of surgery. Um, you know, wounds, scar tissue, very much, you know, all dependent upon collagen. So if there is a collagen defect, you may see scar issues, um, whether that's a scar atrophy, meaning it doesn't really form well. Um, you can, there's some kind of, you know, literature about hypertrophic scars where they kind of bulge out more. Um, but it just all basically it translates to delayed wound healing in general. Um, you know, so following, let's say we're in the, that postpartum patient now, obviously, um, if they choose to become sexually active again, they may have more of that pain with intercourse that we talked about previously, more vaginal dryness, especially in that immediate postpartum period. Um, and like I said, you know, often the therapies that we do for a lot of postpartum pelvic issues like pelvic floor physical therapy may not be as effective because, you know, in a person without EDS, you have that, you know, ligamentous collagen, collagenous support structure that's there that's working properly and if you get the muscles to work okay well that can they can work in tandem but in an eds patient you know the fascial layers may not be you know working properly or working well and so you're putting that much more tension on the muscle 
Um, and so getting it to relax or getting it to, you know, work in a different way, depending on what's going on, may be a little bit of a trickier thing. These patients off also, just in general, tend to have more, you know, joint aches, muscle aches, things along those lines. It's very much a total body, you know, syndrome. Um, and, and so patients with EDS are often found to have, um, you know, be diagnosed as just fibromyalgia, kind of this overall generic, it hurts, you know, when I'm touched type, type um, um, syndrome. Um, and, and so you have to look at this, you know, with EDS patients and know, hey, this is actually related to the EDS. It's not some, you know, potentially something else. Um, if it's just that, or, you know, look at it as part of the gestalt and say, okay, Yes, you have EDS, but maybe this is something too. You know, you always have to kind of keep that in the back of your mind. And obviously patients with EDS can have other medical conditions, um, you know, but you have to ask, is it made worse by the Ehlers-Danlos syndrome being present? Um, with vascular EDS, kind of as patients age, you know, uh, especially we see an increased risk for um, aortic dissections or aortic aneurysms. These are, you know, potentially fatal um, if they're not caught. And so honestly, the average age of death in a patient with vascular EDS is between 40 and 50. And that's typically from a dissecting aortic aneurysm or some sort of vascular, you know, issue there. So pa patients with EDS who have vascular subtype need to be followed by cardiology. And then I guess kind of tying this back to pregnancy, we see those things too, you know, a lot more likely. So, you know, the, uh, sometimes if there is underlying cardiac disease, patients may not be, um, you know, a candidate for actually pushing with delivery. So you, they may have to have what's called an operative vaginal delivery. So either forceps or a vacuum, and that can cause, you know, trauma too. So once again, if you have this condition, you need to put together a team of people that know what's going on with it and know kind of how to, you know, address it. As these patients age and they get into, you know, their menopausal years, like I said before, kind of similar to the prepubescent patient, you can have lots of um, instability in the pelvis um, and in other ligaments too. So that increases your rate of fracture, um, especially if they have underlying osteoporosis. From a vulvovaginal standpoint, we typically see more symptoms in the genitourinary syndrome of menopause with patients with EDS. So in increased vaginal dryness, um, pain with intercourse, urinary tract infections, things along those lines. Um, and that tissue is much more likely to tear or cause fissures with sexual activity. So these patients when they're menopausal should definitely be on some form of a bare minimum vaginal moisturizer, but preferably something like a vaginal estrogen or vaginal DHEA, something that's going to cause and work on things on a hormonal level because that's super important. You've got to have that there too. So, you know, the, the big take home message with EDS, um, you know, is that it is an overarching syndrome or collection of syndromes that we still are learning tons about. Um, you know, it, it's when I was in medical school, you know, we basically what we learned about EDS was patients are really flexible, their skin's stretchy, that's kind of about it. Unless you have the vascular subtype, in that case, that's really bad. But if you don't have the vascular subtype, you're okay. You know, and really what we've learned is that's not necessarily the case. You know, there's lots of things that go into this. Um, you know, you think about, like I said, where collagen is in the body, it's, it's everywhere. So you can literally have issues anywhere in the body with this condition. So it's definitely something, like I said, that if you have EDS, it's very important to put together a team of, of healthcare providers that know what's going on with your condition. Um, if you don't have EDS and you think you may, um, like I said, unfortunately, there's not a really good diagnostic test for everything. Now, certain subtypes, you can look at genomic um, mutations. You can do skin biopsies, kind of depending on the different type there. So once again, finding someone that knows what they're doing with it can help lead to that diagnosis. But all in all, um, it's, you know, from a purely intellectual standpoint, a, a fascinating set of, of conditions that kind of, you know, what they affect. Obviously, for people that have this disease, um, you know, it can be life, you know, consuming or, or life threatening, depending on what type it is. So um, the moral of the story is, though, once again, you are your, you know, best um, advocate and you know your body better than anybody else. So if something feels wrong, if something is off, 
you know, look and see, find a provider that will listen to you and kind of think about these things. This is technically kind of what's called a zebra syndrome, um, kind of a term that we sometimes use to say something's rare, but I honestly think it's probably out there more than we think. Um, and there, as we learn more about it and we have testing that we can do to help kind of diagnose it, we're going to pick it up more and more. So anyway, that's it uh, for today's video. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them below. Otherwise, I will talk to you later. Bye.